Good evening and welcome to Voxypop's second community town hall. I'm your host, Brooke Ginty. Each week, we will bring you a panel of experts to discuss how our communities, businesses, health systems, and government are managing COVID-19. We want to bring national issues to our streets to discuss the issues that are most important to our community. We have a very important show lined up for you tonight to discuss how we move from stay-at-home orders and social distancing to other strategies that would allow our businesses to reopen in a safe and healthy manner. As viewers, we encourage you to ask your questions in the comments below on Facebook or use the chat feature if you are watching us live at voxypop.com backslash town hall. First, a brief word from our sponsor, Vantage Point Retirement Living. Hi, my name is Roseanne Clementes from Arcadia at Limerick Point, opening later this fall. On behalf of all of us at Arcadia, we would like to say thank you to the frontline workers, healthcare, and government leaders who are working so hard to keep us safe during these unprecedented times. We are so proud to have the opportunity to sponsor this Boxy Pop Community Town Hall today. Tonight, we are going to discuss the importance of COVID-19 testing, as well as contact tracing and how it affects privacy and legal concerns. My guests this evening will be Dr. Brian Broker, Caitlin Ringrose, and Jess Capistrant. I'd like to first start with Dr. Broker, who was a guest last week. He was so good, we wanted him back. He is a ear, nose, and throat physician at Phoenixville and Bryn Mawr Hospitals. He is also the Chief Medical Officer for the Physicians Integrated Network, where he directs their efforts to improve outcomes and decreased costs for their 1.6 million patients across the Philadelphia region. Welcome back, Dr. Broker. Thanks, Brooke, for having me. I'm looking forward to having this discussion about how we can open the economy safely. Thank you so much. I am also excited to introduce Caitlin Ringrose. She is an attorney and policy fellow at the Future of Privacy Forum coming all the way to us from Washington, D.C. She works primarily on health, privacy, and legislation, and concentrates on issues related to consumer privacy and pandemics. Welcome. Hi, Brooke. Thanks for inviting me to today's town hall. I'm more than happy to discuss any legal or policy issues related to the current pandemic. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your time. And of course, we would like to bring our very own Jessica Capistrant, who is the president and CEO of Phoenixville Re Regional Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Brooke. Very nice to see you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on and, and talk about our wonderful business community and certainly the topic that's heavy on the mind, which is all the um, opportunities and ideas that we'll have as we approach reopening. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we'd like to start again with Dr. Broker. Last week, for those who uh, were with us, you might see this again, but Dr. Broker has a great couple slides and we're gonna introduce basically what social distancing means, why we're doing it, and then we'll um, lead into issues of testing and contact tracing. So Dr. Broker, can I have you just start and go over um, your slides and, and tell a little bit about uh, what you had to tell the uh, community last week? Sure, thanks Brooke. And I think these slides are so important because they tell the story of where we're starting from and where we wanna go. So the first slide is the one that everybody's used to seeing on the news. And what you see are two different humps. The first one is where the hump is higher than the dotted line. That dotted line is the capacity of the healthcare system to take care of all the sick people that may come in if too many people are getting the virus. So what we've done in the beginning of this pandemic is to simply contain the virus so that it stays below that dotted line. We haven't done anything to weaken the virus, we haven't done anything to strengthen our ability to either prevent getting infected or to fight off the virus. All we've done is to be contained. It. Now, my concern about this graph is it's the only one they show. And the impression is that when you get to the right side of that graph, we're done and the problem's over and nothing could be further from the truth. So we can see on the next slide. There it is. So we can see that at the bottom of that graph, when we start to get to the bottom, if we start to relax the social distancing and we open the economy too fast, then we start to get another surge. 
And so the problem is, if we're not replacing these lockdowns with something different, we're going to keep getting surge after surge after surge, and we're going to have to keep going back in the lockdowns until we have a vaccine, which unfortunately, most experts tell us is not going to be for 18 months at the earliest. So instead, what we want to do is on this next slide. So this next slide comes from an excellent article, and I would encourage everybody to read this. As you see on the bottom right, comes from an author named Thomas Poyo. Um, we have reference to it on our website at entandallergyspecialist.com, and you can go through all his articles. He has a series of articles, starting with this first one where the graph comes from, called The Hammer and the Dance. And what he means by that is that the hammer is where we use these strict measures to contain the virus by shutting down the economy and having social distancing. But the dance means to be a more nuanced way that we can actually still open the economy, but yet prevent infections. And of course, the difference then is that we're trying to keep, you'll see under the word dance, it says keep the R or reproduction number below one. And what that means is the number of people that a sick person will infect. If they infect more than one person, that surge is going to go up. If they infect one person, that line is going to stay flat. And of course, if they infect less than one person on average, then that line is going to go down. And so there's various ways to do that. And the important ways to do that are a available amount of testing, contact tracing, finding out people who the sick person was exposed to and themselves need testing and maybe some isolation uh, and quarantining those people but doing it on a micro-targeted type of fashion. So lastly, I don't know if you want to show this next slide here. So the best example of this, and an example that I think we probably all really want to follow, is South Korea. South Korea has taken these three measures very seriously to be able to keep the number of infections low without closing down their economy. So what you have to have for testing, you have to have rapid tests. Results have to be available 24 to 48 hours. Currently in our state, it takes up to a week to get a result, and that's too long because those people may still infect other people. They have to be widely available. Anybody can get a test. In the beginning of an epidemic, people limit the test to only the obviously sick people, and that doesn't help you identify the people who have no symptoms but are still potentially infectious, and so the disease will not slow down. And in fact, a study from Harvard showed that our state needs 15,000 tests a day, but currently only has 750 tests a day. And so there's problems with insurers who have exclusive contracts with commercial labs that prevent some physician groups from covering that shortfall. And as just an example, our large physician group of about 1,000 physicians is able to bring in a lab with 10,000 tests a day that get us awfully close to that 15,000 day mark but we're up against this brick wall of we can't get in network contracts, we can't bring in the tests. And then there's contact tracing. Contact tracing, again, we have to do in a fast, speedy fashion, critically to prevent those people who are exposed to go around and expose other people, again, to keep that transmission rate or reproduction rate below one. And technology is very helpful for that. That's something we're gonna talk about today. Cell phone apps, credit cards, um, closed circuit TVs, and while this really helps identify potential people who are exposed quickly, it raises a bunch of privacy issues that I think is very worth talking about today. And then, of course, once you identify all these people, then you're going to quarantine these people. Quarantine is where you keep them at home. Self-monitoring is where people are going to monitor themselves for infections. But one of the biggest reasons that South Korea has been such a good example of how to avoid closing their economy is that the people there have a very strong sense of public responsibility. People feel that it's their duty as citizens not to infect their fellow citizens. And you really don't see the protests we have, people saying, I don't want to wear a mask, it's my right not to wear a mask. Because unfortunately, the reality is, is that you may feel it's your right not to wear the mask, but you're putting other people's lives in danger. And I think most of us would probably say, you don't really have a right to do that. So that's- So I, I think, um... I think that you're talking about privacy issues is the exact same reason why we've brought um, Caitlin here tonight with us. I want to take one quick step back and make sure we're talking about the same things when it comes to testing. I think generally we know that there are two types of tests. 
a test if you're sick, and then an antigen test. So Dr. Broker, can you just in very simple terms explain what those tests are and the differences between those two tests? Sure, so the, the first test is what they call the PCR test, and it's just a way that they do the testing and they're able to identify the actual virus. Typically, it's in the nose or the throat or sometimes some secretions from the lungs. And so that'll tell you if you have an active virus. And then there's the antibody test. The antibody test will tell you if your body has made antibodies to the virus. That typically will take about 10 days to two weeks. Um, and so that won't happen until after you're already infected. And the typical antibody test is to see if you have antibodies from a extended period of time, not the ones for an acute infection. So they'll say if you had an infection two weeks ago. Um, and that will give us some good data for the scientists to tell us if the virus is being spreading through the society enough that we don't have to worry so much about um, the virus continuing to spread. And we can have what's called herd immunity. All right. So it seems like we've got a couple of things we got to talk about. We have to talk about testing. Um, and its availability, and then contact tracing, which I know is kind of just starting to bubble in a lot of communication. We are so happy to have Caitlin here because she has been diving deep into contact tracing. So can you first explain what it is and how it would work? Of course. So I do want to say that Dr. Broker is completely correct. All of this right now is about containment and keeping the reproductive rate of the virus down. Just as a general overview, digital contact tracing is generally an on-phone or on-device Bluetooth capability that allows phones to communicate to one another. So this could include sending users kind of ping or notification if they came within six feet of an individual who's tested positive or who's self-reported positive for COVID-19. Just as a general recap, a contact tracing app can function in, in two different ways. It can function on location information, so where you've gone throughout the world. And it can also function on proximity information, which is how far apart individuals are from one another, with CDC guidelines telling us to stay more than six feet away from each other. One can imagine that proximity information is extremely important right now. Actually, Apple and Google just recently rolled out their own contact tracing initiative which is intended to work with governments to better the technologies behind the types of apps they're putting out and the types of containment efforts that they're spearheading. I think that's, um, that's pretty incredible to have Apple and Google working together. That should show you the state of where we are right now and the importance of that. Um, and, and, you know, I think Dr. Broker touched briefly on the issue of privacy rights. I mean, I, I think individually it feels crazy to think of a, having a cell phone be tracked and, and if we are currently in a society where we have seen a lot of people objecting to wearing a mask i can only imagine the privacy rights that that would flow with having this come to an app so what kind of thoughts are being spoken about in your stratosphere about privacy issues when it comes to having these apps on our phones the google and apple initiative in particular has been largely lauded as being very privacy centric because the information that the devices themselves collect stay on your phone. Um, so that means if you get a notification that's not being sent to HHS, that's not sent to the government generally. So this is a great effort, but you also have to remember that there are lots of other contact tracing apps or technologies out there that may be sending your information including not just your location or who you've come in contact with, but your, your sign up, um, perhaps your billing information, those sorts of things. So definitely be wary when it comes to using contact tracing apps, but also be aware that these larger OS shifts by Google and Apple don't necessarily mean that the government is kind of knowing where you are or, or knowing more about you than you would prefer. Of course, and this is why I'm so excited to talk to Jessica tonight, um, there is some interesting questions that these contact tracing apps are being um, used by employers in certain ways. So if employers are requiring employees to show them that they haven't gotten notification or they're, they're re requiring employees to say um, that they will download the app, that, of course, is very um, privacy invasive. I, I think that's a 
an incredibly insightful topic. And, and Jessica, you know, you are here to speak on the behalf of the Phoenixville business community. What? Let's back, take a step back. What is our community saying about opening? You know, I, I, we posed a question online earlier today. If you're a business owner, would you even open tomorrow if you could? So what are you hearing on the streets? So I think every business owner right now is wishing and, and hoping that uh, they had a standard um, economic response right now. Uh, you know, certainly hoping that those dollars were flowing in. So I think business owners would feel torn to say, yes, I wish we were open, but I think that's more so that they're saying, I wish that this was a normal situation because in those same breaths, business owners are sharing that they want to keep their staffs healthy. They want to keep themselves healthy. Um, business owners, of course, know and even live with um, immunocompromised individuals. And so the risks that are associated with this, I think, are being taken very seriously. It's just such a challenge because uh, this time is an extremely real threat to business success. And uh, we're experiencing and seeing that now with unemployment rates. Um, I think we're gonna encroach between a 25 and 30% unemployment rate in Pennsylvania this week. And uh, the, la the final thing that they're also, I think, very concerned with are the liabilities of reopening. Um, so when people are reopening their doors, if they happen to have a smaller storefront or if you're a restaurant, how do people sit in proximity to one another? Um, because there are these discussions rolling out that you may be liable um, if someone comes into your location and then becomes sick. So that's a very big topic. It's one that's being discussed but not fully vetted at this time. And those are the sorts of things we'll be talking through with our members for sure. I mean, I think we're in a time where you know, we do have to weigh out the risks and the benefits of this. And uh, as employers, whether or not you would say to them, uh, please show me that you aren't sick so that you can come into the store because you are responsible for your employees and then you're also responsible for the patrons that come in. And li I mean, as an attorney, I know liability is a huge issue and it's already a topic that has been um, commonly discussed, the, the weighing of the risks and the benefits. but. Um, Dr. Broker, I mean, wouldn't you agree that we can't we can't move out of our homes until we take these kind of drastic next steps? Well, yes, I agree that we have to take these next steps. Um, I, I wouldn't characterize them as being uh, particularly drastic. Uh, I think it's a lot less drastic than staying home and people not working and being able to earn a living. Um, the apps go to and. I think Caitlin can talk to this more, to an incredible length to try and protect people's privacy, but still provide the very rapid notice that it takes to be able to contain this kind of a virus. This virus spreads very easily and very quickly, and it spreads from people who don't have symptoms at least half the time. So if we're not doing something creative to try and catch it, then we're just gonna keep going through periods where we get locked down again, and I think our society will suffer much more because of that. I think it's an interesting, you know, thank you for correcting me on, on the, you know, not, that it's not that massive of a step, because if we think about it, how many times have I <laughs> logged in to use Apple Pay or linked Facebook to another outside app and you agree and you agree so quickly, you hit that button before you know it. Yeah, sure, I'll share all of my Google data to you. Um, but part of that, I think, Caitlin, is it gives the me, the user of that cell phone, the opportunity to say, I want to opt in or not opt in. Are the apps that we're talking about an opt in option or not really? So right now, there are two different ways to have contact tracing on your phone. Um, one is available and one is not quite yet available. The first is you can download an app yourself and that way you are opting in or opting in. You're making the choice and you're exercising consent there. What Apple and Google have done is make the Bluetooth efforts better. So the apps you're already using can just kind of in general tell how far away you are from another phone. Also another thing they've done is make it easier for Android and Apple phones to communicate with one another. This is a change in the API 
that allows these existing apps to be just better at proximity tracing. So for example, if I have an app and Dr. Broker has an app and we have different types of phones, we would still both get an alert if we were in the room together earlier and one of us tested positive. Of course, this does raise privacy issues. Um, if I'm in a room with Dr. Broker and he's the only one I've been in the room with, I'm going to know his, his health status. And furthermore, what about individuals who can't afford these smartphones that support these types of apps? So there are civil liberty issues at play as well. So we talked about the API change, and then there's also a way that's not quite available, but will be soon and for mid-month uh, this month, which is an operating system change. This will allow phone users to get an alert or notification regardless if they have the app or not. Of course, this raises additional concerns. These people haven't downloaded the app. They haven't really consented. However, in this system, they will have the ability to opt in to that operating system change. I think giving some control to that end user obviously is going to be very important when we talk about personal privacy rights. And it's exciting to know that this is something that's coming down the road and how lucky we are to have the advanced technology that we do have. I mean, it's crazy to even think about the fact that our Bluetooth is tracking us. It's crazy and a little scary. Um, Jessica, speaking to business owners, have they, have any, has anybody kind of talked about what they would do right now with the tools that they have in the community to open up and still comply with social distancing and still try to keep a business open while remaining safe? Yes, I think all business owners would be very willing to follow CDC and state guidelines, right? So as it stands right now, that's what we're determined to do. Um, I think additionally, our business community I can speak to has definitively used a ton of ingenuity in this time. Um, many of them have done all the right things, applying for waivers, uh, reaching out to their elected officials and, and communicating a lot through us with elected officials to learn um, the parameters of uh, doing curbside, doing um, even adding things to their website. We've done a little bit of um, education and some things that we'll be working on is also uh, opening up some education where we're trying to work through our local elected officials offices and SCORE to provide um, e-commerce training, for example. I do think that we're going to see a consistency in the e-commerce purchasing side of things. Um, we do have a member that reported to us one of the ideas they had was uh, they are a retail shop, they have a small retail space, and so their plan is to implement a ring doorbell system. So you arrive at the ring doorbell, you press it or it automatically alerts uh, staff maybe that you're there. You can order through that process and then you would receive a way to pay, which perhaps is maybe through an invoicing system that gets sent to your phone. Uh, you pay for the product and then it's brought out to you at a social distance. Um, we know that masking obviously is going to be in our future for a long time. And again, when business owners have these concerns about opening up, um, it's to keep everybody safe. Um, so the staffs are going to have to also adjust to those things. Um, there has been also talk, and certainly many businesses now that are essential, are using the um, temperature taking, for example, at the start of each shift. Um, and, and that gets into um, some privacy and tracking, again, with the liability that arises um, you know, how, how does a business owner safely keep that information um, within their business and um, what does that lead to down the road? So those are some things I know folks are working on now. I, I think it's, um, it's an interesting state where we're at because, you know, we've talked about this now. We have a new norm. You know, we're all living in this new norm and um, we often travel, you know, out of the country or, or to different states and we commonly go through borders and get asked, you know, where have you been lately? Have you been to this country? Have you been to that country? Have you been sick lately? And I think we so commonly just answer those questions without even thinking about it because it's become a norm. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we are going to be establishing these new norms about taking temperatures of our uh, employees when they, when they arrive and potentially using these contact tracings within our own businesses. Um, I'd also like to invite our viewers, if you are a business owner, we want to hear from you. If you can post uh, online and let us know, would you use these contact tracing apps and would you require your own employees to use them?
Um, Jessica, what do you think? Do you think Phoenixville businesses would, would be comfortable with this? That's really tough to say, I guess, without surveying folks. Um, but I do think there is the motivation to get back to it. I think, again, their concerns would arise with how, what are my liabilities here of actually, A, holding on to this information, B, you know, if somebody becomes sick, what is the formal protocol? I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of, I'm just going to say vague information or guidance that's coming down. Um, and again, something that we're working on as the chamber is with uh, at the county level, we're, and, and we're seeing some success already with this, we are working to draft um, from, I guess, the county level, of course, the county's working to draft an interpretation of uh, the state uh, regulations. Um, because again, as a business owner, when you're, you're going online, and um, this example was used with me today, there's a, a new seven page document from the, the governor, um, which is much more concise than a lot of documentation that people have been putting out. But then it has, you know, maybe seven or 10 links within it that you click it and it takes you to another three page thing or another five page thing. And so it's just becoming really difficult for people to stay on top of the information. Um, so we're working with them to get that into a completely, you know, correct but concise form, not only for businesses, but also for consumers, um, because consumers are going to need to feel the confidence to go back into the businesses and know that the businesses are doing, you know, quote unquote, all the right things. The challenge right now is defining what all those right things are. I mean, we, we talked about with Dr. Broker looking at what uh, South Korea was doing, and obviously we are going to have to learn from the countries that came before us. Caitlin, have other countries that you're aware of used contact tracing like we've talked about tonight, and how are they doing? Yeah, economies across the board are suffering right now, and from an international perspective, governments have started engaging in contact tracing by creating um, or using existing apps. So Dr. Broker cited South Korea, which is using its own government-sponsored app, which has largely been um, applauded as being one of these things that has really kept their R rate down. In terms of other governments, the European Commission recently requested that mobile carriers provide anonymized and aggregate mobile location data. So anonymized data is a little bit safer for users. It's not really going to say who you are and where you've been, but necessarily just where people and flows of people have gone to. And South Africa also recently requested the same information to kind of track people's movements in general. This is helpful to figuring out things like where do we need more hospital beds? Where is the virus going to spread to next? And really get on top of things in a preventive way. So another thing Jessica mentioned too, aside from contact tracing, is that there are all these other sorts of technologies that are proliferating and folks are kind of starting to rely on. So she mentioned in particular the Ring doorbell. There are often things in conjunction with Ring and, and other technologies like facial recognition cameras and temperature monitoring. So that could be temperature monitoring crowds or of individuals. Of course, these things each raise their own uh, privacy issues. And I think in particular, we wanna make sure that for contact tracing that individuals are opting in and giving their express consent and employers are making sure that they're operating with efficacy in mind. And so something like temperature monitoring if you're going to monitor all of your employees' temperatures or all your patrons' temperatures, you should be aware that things like chronic illness or pregnancy can cause an elevated temperature. And those are situations that a person may not want to disclose their health information to you. Um, so there are privacy ways, privacy centric ways of doing this, um, but also examine the technology, learn as much as you can about it before implementing it in your business. I feel like we're in a Mission Impossible movie right now with the things that we're talking about. We're talking about facial recognition and temperature scanning. And I mean, I think we all know that this, you know, is part of our uh, part of our world, but we're not all working for the FBI. So we're going to have to get used to it being a part of our everyday. Um, you know, I asked you this question last time, Dr. Broker. I'm going to ask again, how are we doing here in Phoenixville? 
Well, so, so far, if you look at the data that we have by county, um, you know, Chester County's numbers um, are starting to level off um, and we haven't had a 14 day decline yet. And if you look at what the criteria that's been put out by CDC, that's been put out by the White House and other health organizations, uh, we want to see a 14 day uh, consistent decline uh, before we start opening up the economy. Um, the governor of Pennsylvania has uh, set a date where they estimate that's going to happen um, and they actually hope that's going to happen starting next week. Um, time will tell because we've always had a certain amount of um, social distancing. Some people did it, some people really didn't do it very well. And so the question is, is as we start to loosen up, are we going to see that start to go back up again? And when it, when the rate of rise, in other words, how fast it started to increase, gets to a certain number, that's when they're going to pull the plug and we're going to have to go back into uh, uh, containment again. So if we can continue to do those things while we're building these other measures, while we're building the contact tracing and while we're building uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the testing regimen that we need, because we really need a lot more tests and a lot more available fast tests, uh, then, then I think we'll be really be ready to open. I, the concern I have, and, and this is something that I, I would encourage all of our viewers to, to contact your um, legislators directly in the state uh, legislature and in the federal legislature and hold their feet to the fire on these two issues and say to them, look, we can't open the economy until we have better testing and better tracing. What are you doing for that? Um, and we're just not seeing the organized effort that we need. That is the part to me that is the most disturbing. You know, we just had a, a question come up in our live stream that I think follows right on to that statement of yours, Dr. Broker. Anyon says, can the doctor speak to the effectiveness of the antibody testing now with what is considered phase one? And should someone take the test now and risk a false positive or wait until the test is more mature? Well, sure. Let me talk about that. So one of the problems is there's been this, uh, there's been, there's been this uh, news that says, there's a lot of tests out there that aren't good and they're aren't valid. Um, and I think you do have to be careful which tests you're getting. Hopefully, and in most cases, your physician is picking tests for you that, ha that are the most valid tests. Um, I will tell you that the vast majority of antibody testing in Pennsylvania today is being done by the two labs, Quest Labs and LabCorp, and they're both using a similar test. Um, it has about a 98% accuracy to it. Um, and so that means that it's pretty accurate. Um, I, I would caution people to be concerned about the term FDA approved. There simply are no FDA approved tests yet because that process takes a long time to do. And these tests are all brand new, brought on the market because of the emergency for their use. Um, and so there just hasn't been time for any of these things to be FDA approved. They have been FDA cleared and that's a different hurdle. That hurdle means that the FDA looked at their internal data of, of, uh, from the company that made it and said, okay, we think this is a good test to use. Um, so really, I think the tests don't really need to mature. Um, the other part is, yes, absolutely get tested. Everyone needs to get tested, whether you had symptoms or don't have symptoms. It is how the scientists figure out where the sick people are and how we can safely open the economy. Now, one of the problems is, in many areas of the state, you can't get a test unless you have symptoms, and that skews all the results. We ultimately want to know how many people are sick amongst the whole population. But if we're only testing sick people, it's going to look like more people are sick than aren't if you only look at the testing results. We want to have just a random sample of the population, and that really means everybody should be getting tested. Are there test now. Can I call my doctor in Phoenixville and say, I want to come in for an antigen body test? There are. And as I say, Quest is doing them, LabCorp is doing them, which is basically the vast majority of, of the tests that will be done for all insurances in Pennsylvania. Um, the antibody tests are relatively plentiful. We're not really having a hard time with those. The one we're having a hard time with is the one that tests for active virus. Um, and if you had to pick one that you'd want to be have a hard time with, this is the wrong one. We would rather have a plentiful test for the active virus. That's how we can really pick up if people are sick now or going to be sick and develop symptoms soon because they're asymptomatic carriers 
or soon to be sick patients. Um, that one is still in very short supply. It's being limited uh, by the places that are doing the test as to who they'll give the test to. And I understand their reasoning until we get more of them. They want to make sure that the actively sick people are cared for first. And I agree. I think that's important. But the problem is it doesn't give us the information we need to open the economy. We need to have at least 15,000 tests a day available in the state of the active virus tests to be able to safely open our economy. We only have 750 out of those 15,000. We need more. Um, and we really need all of our viewers to call the legislators and say, we need more active virus tests. What are you doing to get us more active virus tests? That's good uh, information. And I would ask our any constituent who's concerned about testing and the ability of testing to do just that. Uh, I did pose a question to our business owners. I have a couple answers. Cameron Peters, she says, we are open and operating, but we are not allowing anyone in the shop. We have also installed a doorbell for ease of letting us know when somebody needs assistance or pickup. So we can tell that our local businesses here in Phoenixville are working toward a solution to open their doors and do it safely. Uh, I have Linda who says, I own a business, would refuse to use the app and would not expect my subcontractors to. Uh, Marlena Harrington says, no, I would not use contact tracing. That's a huge privacy breach. Uh, so, you know, what we've heard so far is that privacy is an, a very huge concern. So, Caitlin, how would you answer that question or that concern? I think it's hard. We all know that our health data is incredibly sensitive. And it's also very useful to these data-driven efforts, right? We have epidemiologists and health research saying that we need to know who's sick in which areas. And a lot of that depends on self-reporting, uh, either through an app or in some other manner. And so all of this kind of data-driven effort around figuring out where the virus is going next and um, how to best serve individual needs, really do rely on people being willing uh, to, to give up their information and to give up their information for greater good. Of course, we also in this country have a very hard time trusting our, our government and these large tech companies with our data. And of course, this is something that I hugely empathize with and I worry about every day about the amount of information we're giving up. And so that's why we really need to make sure that after the close of the pandemic, that this information is deleted. In particular, our protected health information. So any information that we give talking about our um, positive or, or negative status, our location information, proximity information, all of that, anything that's being used by health research needs to be destroyed. And so that's actually something that's happening on Capitol Hill right now. Legislators in particular have just drafted a bill around the destruction of this data after HHS declares the pandemic over. But of course, that's just a draft bill. Um, that bill hasn't even come to the floor yet and hasn't passed. But something like that, I think, would give consumers a lot more security and the fact that, hey, my data will be destroyed after the close of the pandemic, and it will only be used for socially beneficial purposes. That ties into the trusting of the government, which I know is, is, is a difficult thing when the government feels so large, Apple feels so large, Google feels so large in our everyday lives. The thought of, well, personally, I think they probably already have all the data they need anyways. Um, you know, I don't think there's a you know, maybe call me a skeptic. I'm not sure there's a way to stop it, but at least if we have them publicly saying they're going to get rid of that data, I think this is this is a totally different world, obviously, that we're living in, and that data is to save other people, and I would hope that the government and Apple and Google and the likes would use it with the same sensitivity as the information that's being supplied. Um, Dr. Broker, do you think that there's any way to move past this in an efficient, safe way without these type of apps, contact tracing, without knowing who's sick around you? Well, con contact tracing has been the cornerstone of a, a pandemic uh, medicine uh, and public health uh, since the beginning of the science. And 
you know, you're talking over 100 years ago. Um, so they were always doing contact tracing, but they were just doing it on foot. Um, and if you, uh, I, again, I would encourage people to read the articles from Thomas Boyo. He has uh, some good discussions in there about contact tracing and its history. Um, but, you know, in, in recently in Japan, for example, or not Japan, I'm sorry, in China, they used the contact tracing uh, combination of things. And they were able to, to, what they would say, clear an entire sick person's file of everybody they were around with five contact tracing uh, 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 members of the health department in one day. But you can only really get that done in one day if you're using various kinds of technology. You know, in the early 1900s, uh, when they were looking at some of the early pandemics back then, it would take them weeks to find everybody. And the problem with find, taking weeks is that that virus continues to spread exponentially because each person is infected and they go infect more people and then more people. So those contact tracers have a bigger and bigger circle they have to keep following. If you if you have this technology and you can get it done within 24 hours, that circle is much smaller, and so it's much more effective. Uh, so I think it's I think that's a very important uh, note to talk about the fact that contact tracing has been a part of our epidemiological studies and a part of addressing pandemics for as long as we've known it, because. I think it's probably the first time we're hearing contact tracing as a normal everyday citizen that it has come to our streets to talk about. So I appreciate that that insight. Um, let me bring a live question to you from Alan. It's on discussing privacy. Is it true that if one opted into a new operating system, then you would be opting into the tracking system? Can I upgrade without opting in? Is there any type of act that will track and pass on this info or have or do you have to specifically opt in and download a specific app for the info to be tracked? I think Caitlin, you might be able to answer that question or at least parts of that. Yeah, absolutely. So Google and Apple's announcement really hinged on the fact that individuals have downloaded existing apps. And so if you were to change your operating system and upgrade, then you would just not have to download an app and you would be fine. But later on down the line, they have a proposed second phase, which is that it, this wouldn't be app dependent. Users of any OS, generally newer OSs, because you do need better technology in order to power these types of technologies, would um, be able to opt in, regardless of whether they have an app or not. However, as far as I know, all of this does depend on user consent, whether that's downloading an app or having the OS shift and then ask you for your affirmative consent. I haven't heard of anything that's just you upgrade to a new OS and then your um, proximity information and your location information becomes used for epidemiological and health research. For those of us who don't know what OS is, it's operating system. Sometimes I have to <laughs> explain the, the verbiages here. So, I mean, I think we all have seen the, the alerts come on your phones. There's a new operating system. And then there's the 10 pages that you scroll. Yep, 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 yep. I, I'm a lawyer and I still scroll, scroll, scroll <laughs> and say I consent. So I think that that's an important thing to know is that you still have to opt into that tracking um, option of that. Uh, for the same business community members that say that they would not uh, want to have those apps and they would not want to uh, breach that privacy, I guess I want to ask you the same questions. If it meant you could open up your businesses tomorrow safely and securely, would you do so? I think that highlights our risk and benefit analysis that we've been talking about tonight because in order for us to contain this, the way that I've, that I've seen it is social distancing it has been our reactive, right? Uh, it's out there we're in trouble, get inside, slow it. And now we have to, now we realize after day, I don't know, 56, 57, I've lost count that we have to move to that next stage. So now we're being reactive. Um, so business owners, let us know, would you, if you could open up your doors and start your businesses tomorrow and start earning that money back and start reviving that economy, would you accept those, those offers to, to be contact tracing? Uh, please let us know and give us a little shout out on Facebook. I do have a question as well for Dr. Broker. How would anyone know who is contagious and when one can't get the testing? And what about an asymptomatic carrier who can't be tracked? Um, well, well, two good questions. Um, if, 
if you know who a uh, an asymptomatic carrier, you're not going to know, um, and that's one of the biggest problems, um, and that's one of the difficult things to find. Um, you will start to notice sick people around them, and then ultimately they may find them on contact tracing because some of their contacts is, are going to get sick. And then if you can find that person, you'll you'll work your way back to that person. Um, and uh, um, so I think you know people have heard of the the, the person Typhoid Mary, who was you know the the uh, a, a very well known historic story about somebody who was an asymptomatic carrier who was just infecting a lot of people not knowing, and eventually they worked their way back and found that person through contact tracing. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, read that second part of the question again. Okay, the second part of the question is, is what about asymptomatic carriers who can't be oh, no, tracked? That was, that's the part I answered. What was the first The, the other first one part? is, how would anybody know who's contagious when you can't get the testing? W right, exactly, big problem. and and and. It's it goes a little bit even beyond that. It, if somebody's sick right now, we seem to have enough tests, um, and so that's enabled us to get somebody cared for if they're sick. The problem now is that we've come up with a tremendous amount of protocols how we test people so that we can safely move forward back into the economy. For example, they're talking about having us go back and start to do um, elective surgeries. Now, elective surgery is a vague term because if you're sick and you're waiting to get into surgery, doesn't it doesn't feel so elective and you can get sicker. So it can become a bigger problem as you're waiting. Um, but we have to do these protocols of testing these people to make sure they're not infected so they don't endanger the whole healthcare team when they're doing that surgery. For those patients, um, we can't get tests. It's just not available. And, and uh, because I'm a surgeon on the ground every day. And as recently as today, I was calling all over town trying to find tests for my patients who need surgeries and I can't get them. So that's a big problem. And again, that's where we have to push our legislators to take action. They're able to um, get more of these tests. We have tests available um, that we can bring into the state and they're just not willing to take the steps necessary to do it. Um, and it's, it's about contracts of insurers. It's about business. It's not about healthcare and it shouldn't be about business right now. It should be about healthcare. I have another question for you here, uh, and it's maybe rhetorical, but maybe we can, can shed some light onto it. So many people are not following the already established safety conventions. How can we expect them to opt into contact tracing? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, we, we, we live uh, around Phoenixville, and and it's such a beautiful place to, to be. And we, I'll take my kids out for a bike ride. I can't tell you how many times that we'll ride past people who are gathering on each other's driveways. Um, you know, we, we rode past, you know, one family having a, having a party on their driveway. And, and, and uh, you know, obviously they, they feel that it was necessary. There's a lot of kids that are graduating from school now. And there's a lot of things where parents feel like this is a one-time life event for their family. They don't want to miss out on. I understand that. Um, I think it's going to be possible, it's going to be necessary for us to do these things with a certain amount of social distancing and caution when we do it. Um, but I think that everybody has to be very careful. Um, so many people feel like, oh, you know, what I do, I'm very small, I'm not going to have a big effect. But remember that if everybody feels that way, then nobody's social distancing. So it, it, that's where that sense of uh, social responsibility comes into. You really have to feel like Everyone else in the community is part of your family, and you're responsible for all of your family. I think that's an important way to think about it. And we, we talk about it in Phoenixville. We say we're all in this together, and we truly are in this all in this together um, because we all have to stay indoors so that we can all get out of the doors and let our children run and play with other people than us. Sorry, I said that again as a parent with kids at home. Um, let me ask another question here, uh, and I guess the question is whether whether we are doing this, but why are we not right now doing normal, logical contact tracing and having those people tested? So I'm assuming if somebody gets sick, wouldn't you then test spouses, friends we saw recently, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Broker, do you know whether or not that is is happening right now with contact tracing that we're doing locally? Yeah, yes, it is being done right now locally. The problem is, 
is that we don't have this technology involved. And so it's overwhelming. There's too much for the contact tracers who work for the health department to trace everybody. Mm -hmm. And so they, they and, and the, uh, the county has told me as recently as last week, they gave up on the tracing. It, it, was, it was too much work to do and there were too many people who were sick. They just couldn't follow everybody. If they had the technology involved, they could have far fewer people doing far more work. And then we could actually do that keeping track of people. But early on in the beginning, they were doing it. And now it's it, there's just too many people for the amount of people they've hired. And even if they hired more, they wouldn't be able to keep up with it without the technology. Absolutely. And if I can weigh in there, um, it's not just about, you know, not having enough boots on the ground. Even if we did have enough um, public health researchers going to door to door and saying, you know, you had a party and your neighbor is now sick and now we're going to kind of do this um, search and, and figure out who has contacted who. It's also about the fact, as Dr. Broker has said multiple times, we just don't have testing protocol in place. So even if we had the best technology possible and everyone opted in, we would still need to know who has tested positive and who has tested negative. This information is all about self-reporting. And if individuals can't accurately self-report their positive or negative status, then the technology is really not doing anything. Well, if uh, I mean, I think I think the thing is, if you think about it, there is a whole lot of self-reporting. I mean, I've seen friends and family members report on Facebook, right? If you think about it, we are comfortable enough sharing some of the most intimate data on Facebook and our and these social media platforms, just so that everybody knows what's going on in our lives. And I think we should extend that one step further. And so just so people are protected in our lives and in our communities. Uh, Jessica, let me ask you a question. Um, are there any local established guidelines right now for Phoenixville businesses on how they can open up their businesses when they are allowed to do so? At this point in time, no. I think the most localized that's going to get is Chester County. And again, that's because chambers in this county and our county commissioners are willing to work to interpret and disseminate that information. Um, the best we can get right now are the unfortunate vague guidelines that are available through the state of Pennsylvania and the CDC. So those who are open right now and um, doing takeout or curbside, they are urged to follow those guidelines. And that is the only present information that they have. Yeah, I, I think we said it last time. We're all, we're all moving this day by day, answering these questions day by day. And I think there's a obviously general sentiment that the guidance is not coming from federal government and it's being placed on the, the shoulders of the states and then on the shoulders of the counties individually and then the municipalities to figure it out. Uh, so I want to um, commend you, Jessica. You are doing, a, I know you're doing an incredible job here locally. Dr. Broker, you as well for, for getting on these platforms and disseminating this information, which is incredibly important. I do have an important question that was just added in. I think it's a really, a really important one. Uh, most of the people who don't have access to these more advanced devices are the elderly populations who are most at risk. Um, how does contact tracing help them if they don't have compatible devices? Uh, Caitlin, do you know from other countries around the world how, how that's working? Unfortunately, contact tracing, at least digital contact tracing, is only good as the technology individuals are using. And so if individuals don't have smartphones, in some cases the newest or newer version of a smartphone, then they may not be able to get the benefits that come along with contact tracing or the benefits that come along with just getting a simple notification on their phone. That doesn't mean that contact tracing largely doesn't help them. If their neighbor gets a notification saying to stay home, maybe that's one less instance where an elderly individual will come in contact with them. So it's not to say they're not getting any benefit, but the fact is there's a major lapse in this country between individuals who can afford smartphones who can afford to even be on the internet, have access to broadband, and those who can't, or those who um, are not internet savvy or not, not comfortable on mobile phones 
using these kinds of apps. And so it is very important that we keep our elderly vulnerable population in mind and, and start thinking of ways to help bridge this gap. Brooke, also, if I could make a point. Sure. Um, the point I wanted to make is that the the uh, the uh, community member asked, you know, what about uh, some of the elderly population who is most at risk not having access to the contact tracing? How does it help them? I think, I think sometimes we confuse the difference between being at risk for getting sick from the virus versus uh, being at risk of spreading the virus, and they're two very different things. So the contact tracing really helps us to people who are likely to spread the virus, and those people are mostly young people who are going to have few or no symptoms. So the contact tracing really is very important more for the younger population, and for the elderly population, the contact tracing will help them even if they don't have access to the devices, and in part because of uh, what Caitlin had to say, that if the other people in the neighborhood are known who's infected, who's not, uh, then the elderly people are at less risk of coming into contact with somebody and then catching it and then getting very sick. So there's a difference. And I, I think that's an important kind of point to make. This is pretty trickled down as well. Uh, and I, you know, my grandmother, who is 90, who does have a cell phone and knows how to rock a good text message and play words with friends, uh, she would probably opt in and, and know, get that contact. But, but I know as her granddaughter, I would opt into those apps and I would want to know um, if people around me were exposed so that I wouldn't go see her. And I, and I think that goes back into, you know, we are all in this together and there are some sincere concerns with privacy and data, but uh, those, those have to be weighed against the severe risks of this virus spreading beyond and taking more lives than it already has. So I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I'd like to thank our guests, our online viewers, for your time tonight. Thank you for all of those important questions that you've asked. I hope we've provided some answers. Uh, it, this has been extremely informative dialogue, and I want it to continue. So if you have questions online, feel free to post them on our Facebook page. We'll make sure to try to get them answered to next time. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedules and for all that you're doing to help keep us safe and keep our businesses moving forward and for um, tackling those very difficult privacy questions. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. All right. Uh, we will be continuing our COVID-19 discussions in our next VoxyPop Community Town Hall as we take a hard look at bringing a local testing lab online and the challenges of working within state and federal guidelines. Stay tuned to the VoxyPop platform for more details and the date of that upcoming show. In the meantime, please stay in touch with us with your questions, comments, and ideas for new topics. Uh, you can watch the show again by visiting voxypop.com backslash town hall. If you missed our first one, it was a dynamic one. Please go back. You can watch it there again. Check out our VoxyPop Facebook page. I'd like to say a final thank you to our sponsor, Vantage Point Retirement Living. You can new, learn more about their latest location called Arcadia at Limerick Point, located in Limerick, Pennsylvania. I'm Brooke Inty. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I want you to stay, stay home, stay safe, stay well, and have a very wonderful evening.